what we really need to understand is markets solve human emotional needs. Do I want to be treated like some anonymous humanoid or yeah. would I prefer to do business with somebody who knows me? You get all these layers between you and your customers. If you think of an organization of the planet and the customers are kind of floating around the outside, and uh, the people on the front line of the organization, they're kind of on the surface of the planet. And then the more senior you get, the more inside the planet you are. And it's very difficult to get somebody to understand something that they think they already know. So they're almost trying to do the right thing, but they just don't realize they're disconnected. We're in this epidemic of feedback survey, but the problem is that this information goes into organizations and it convinces leaders that they're close to what matters to customers. And all this data coming in, conversely, is making organizations less close to customers rather than closer, but it convinces people they are closer. Because we've lost that emotional experience. So to get that back, you need to start to reconnect with customers. It's natural, it's a natural human bias. You need to be observing the world, you need to be open to the world, and you need to be kind of making the most of all of those different occasions. Well, hello everyone, it's Jim O'Shaughnessy with yet another episode of Infinite Loops. Today I have a very special guest that I've been really looking forward to after my friend Rory Sutherland told me, don't be daft, read this book and have John on your bloody podcast. And so I always do what Rory tells me to do. My guest today is John Sills, the author of The Human Experience, How to Make Life Better for Your Customers and create a more successful organization. He's also the managing director of the foundation and works closely with Young Enterprise, which is a charity that helps young adults become the next generation of entrepreneurs. And, and the thing that I love, John, is 25 years ago, you say you started your career in the stalls of Essex in the UK. Tell me about that and welcome. Yeah. The Thank you. Thanks, Jim. And thanks for having me on the, on the show. I, I can't promise to be quite as engaging as Rory is because he's a master storyteller, but I will, I will try nonetheless. But yeah, I, I, you know, 25 years ago, I was on a market stall in Essex. I was 14 years old. I, uh, I got asked, I went to church at the time and a lady ran the, a local haberdashery market stall and she asked if I'd go along and work there for a pound an hour. And I thought, well, yeah, I could do with a little bit of extra pocket money. So I, uh, I started my career as I, as I see it back then, age 14 on the market still. And you just learn so much, you know, even now I think back to that time because you just learn so much from being in front of real people, you know, trying to understand what matters to people, trying to understand what a good experience is like, trying to sell things to them as well. And I was selling things I had no idea about, a 14 year old boy selling haberdashery. I still don't really know what it is. It's just a lot of kind of threads and needles as far as I could see. But it was a great grounding in life. And I think that's really stayed with me throughout my whole career. So yeah, 25 years ago, it's a lot longer ago than I wish it was, but it still, uh, still stays with me. What, what, one of the things that I loved about reading that is, so I had a job. Uh, my first real job was actually doing professional magic, uh, right. which, was, which was a lot of fun. But then I had a job at a service station and I was really struck by the idea that you know, so much has changed right now. Back then, people would come in, literally, we'd shoot the shit. <laughs> you know, how you doing? What's going on? Good to see you, Jim. We actually knew each other. All of the customers who would come in, like, we always reserved time to just sit and chat. One of your central uh, ideas in the book, which I really agree with, is that we've lost that human element. Talk a bit about that. And Another thing that I loved with you, 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 you said uh, of all the things that you've uh, that done, being a bank manager uh, during a financial crisis, not fun. <laughs> but then I, I love where you go up to visit strangers' houses and ask them very personal questions. Very, very fun. Yeah. Tell me about that. that. That is a lot of fun. I should say that they're all consenting. They know that I'm going to be going to the house to ask them or, more, or, or most of them. Are. I mean, I think, I think you're right. You know, through, through all of certainly the early part of my career, it was front facing directly with customers. As you say, I was a, yeah, I was a, I started my life in, in a bank, uh, HSBC. I then was a bank manager in the financial crisis. And there's so many stories and people from that time that stay with me. You know, I remember one time we had this idea that we were going to become the first bank in the UK to have a radio station playing. Because up until then, it, it, banks were just completely silent. And uh, we, we 
had this radio and it was a guy called Bruno Brooks. He was a big DJ in the UK in the 1980s and it was his radio station. And I remember this customer came in, he was a business customer. He used to come in every day to pay in his money. And he, he came up and sought me out because he knew I was the manager and he tore strips off me. He was like, this is ruined my banking experience. I used to come in, this was my bit of peace and quiet for the day. Now I've got this awful music playing and he was really going for it. And I said to him, I said, what kind of music do you like? And he said, classical music. And I said, well, look, it, not that it'll, I understand you're really angry, but just so you know, there is a classical section at 9.30 and 2.30 every day on the radio, just, just in case you're interested. Anyway, the next few days, he starts coming in at 2.30 rather than at lunchtime. And after about a week, he comes up to me and he says, John, I love it. This is the best thing. I come in here, I get to listen to this amazing music. It's fantastic. And it was, it was really interesting, this kind of story. And there's all these kind of stories that stay with me of as soon as you get into head office, you start to, you know, a more senior organization, you get all these layers between you and your customers. And um, we call it inside out thinking. I talk a bit about this in, in the book. It, you can't help it. It's natural. It's a natural human bias because you're surrounded by your own business, your own colleagues, your own industry, your own regulators. And even if you think you're close to your customer, if you can't be. So having these kind of stories and this kind of connection is what enables me and us as an organization. And I think generally with businesses that do this well, they're the people, they're the businesses and the leaders that find ways to stay close to what matters to the customers. And that's what brings me to the me going in to hang out with strangers in their houses. Because what we do as a business is try and get clients, get our clients, get us, get CEOs and CMOs that we work with. We get to go to customers' houses and go shopping with them. And it's a whole load of other stories I can tell you about that later on. But that's at the heart, I guess, of what, what I'm trying to look at. Because at the book, it's called, as you say, the human experience. The point is over the last 20 years, we've really perfected the functional experience, doing more things in more ways, more quickly than ever before. But in doing that, I mean, customers are no more satisfied. In fact, in America, they're less satisfied as a Wall Street Journal study I saw recently. It's because we've lost that emotional experience. We've lost that emotional connection. And that's actually the thing that people really enjoy, whether they know it or not. And there's a lot of examples of how that's happening. So to get that back, you need to start to reconnect with customers. Otherwise, you end up with organizations full of humans that just aren't allowed to act in a human way. You know, there's a great book uh, that I recommend often called The Genius of the Beast, A Radical Revision of Capitalism by Howard Bloom. And that's his case in the book. His entire case is, uh, guys, <laughs> we, we have so overemphasized all of the process, all of the procedural, all of the numeric. And what we really need to understand is markets solve human emotional needs. And he has some great passages in there. And I just find myself wondering, like, what, why is this so fucking hard to understand? Like, uh, it, it, uh, how do I want to be treated, right? Do I want to be treated like some anonymous uh, humanoid? <laughs> or or yeah. would I prefer to do business with somebody who knows me? It's like, before we started recording, we we did what human beings do. We had a chat and you told me about your lovely uh, vacations with your sons and I told yeah. you about my grandkids. That's what human beings do. W what's blocking yeah. that? Yeah, I think, and I think this is, this is the fascinating question. I mean, in the book, I talk about these three myths that I think kind of start to get in the way. Partly it's a question about efficiency. The, the organizations and people in organizations believe they have to work in a certain way. There's this kind of odd hierarchy that exists that, and this inside out thinking that stops people realizing they're not thinking outside in. You know, I, you know, the companies I worked for, that I've worked in, everyone thinks they're being customer led. You know, I never worked with anyone that was a horrible person. Everyone was trying to do the right thing, but they just don't realize they're disconnected. And part of that, so the first myth I talk about is the myth of customer feedback. There's never been more customer data coming into organizations. It's full of it. And it's the same in the US as it is in the UK and across Europe. We're in this epidemic of feedback surveys. You can't have any experience with an organization now without immediately being asked, what did you think about the experience? What would you recommend us? Give us a rating out of 10. And, and this, this information floods into organizations. But the problem is, you know, if you think about customers' lives as being this kind of wedge shape, you know, at the thick end of the wedge, you've got your customer's life, the real people, the things that really matter to them, their hopes, dreams, ambition, their friends, their family, my sons, your grandkids, as you were talking about, 
You've got, you know, the, the, the things we're trying to achieve, our business, our work, the challenges we've got, the services we used to help. And right at the thin end of that wedge is that organization and that organization's role. But 99% of all of that information that's coming into organizations is at the thin end of the wedge. What do you think about us? What do you think about our service? What do you think about our product? Would you recommend this? And in, in itself, it's okay because it's okay to have that kind of information. But the problem is that this information goes into organizations and it convinces leaders that they're close to what matters to customers. Whereas in truth, they're only really close to customers' opinions of their business. And there's a subtle but significant difference between those two things. And so it becomes a kind of semantic thing because as leaders believe they're close to their customers, then when they get challenged on it, they say, no, 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 I know exactly what my customers Look at all this data I've got. But they do that. And in doing that, they stop going to really get close to what matters to customers. They stop going to visit their houses. So it's a, it's a, it's a bit of a fool's errand, all this data coming in. Conversely, is making organizations less close to customers rather than closer, but it convinces people they are closer. Yeah, and it's very difficult to get somebody to uh, understand something that they think they already know, right? So, so they think that they're close to the customer, and that I, I was really struck by that because it reminded me of you know the fiasco of Robert McNamara when he was the Defense Secretary in the United States during the Vietnam War, and literally he thought he was a data junkie and. Now, mind you, this is coming from a quant, right? This is coming from yeah, somebody who yeah. builds algorithms for a living or used to. Um, and, and yet he was so blind to the fact that, first off, all of the people reporting to him, there were hierarchy problems. They were terrified of telling him bad news. Um, and, and so the news was definitely cleansed before it got up to him. And there he is at his whiteboard or chalkboard or whatever he was using, thinking, oh man, we are doing so well in this war. If all he would have done is go over and like not even spend time with the generals, just go hang out with the grunts. Yeah. He, he yeah. would have gotten a much more complete picture. Why don't people do that? Yeah, I, I think it's a brilliant question. I mean, there's, there's two things I think that, that stand out to me for that. One is that actually a, a lot of senior leaders are actually a bit afraid of doing it. And that's because most of their contact with customers comes in the form of complaints. So, you know, organizations set up these customer closeness programs. And what that really is, is once a month, an executive has to call a customer that's unhappy. So they, they actually start to become uncomfortable with it. And after a while, you know, think about it. You've got people that love working on the front line in branches, in stores, on market stores, being with people. And you've got people that love working in head office. And actually, there is a personality type there. And quite often, some of the people that work in head office don't want to they want to be the people working on the front line. So some of them are a little bit a little bit uncomfortable with doing it. I think the, the, the other problem is that quite often people in organizations, they don't really want to hear the inconvenient truths because it gets in the way of their strategy. And what we find is, and what I've found in, in writing the book, is that all of it, even with all of this data comes in, even if you go and do the research and you do go and understand what matters to customers at the thick end of the wedge, if you go in and you present it on a PowerPoint or a PDF, people in the room would rather question the methodology than accept the inconvenient truth. They'd rather say, well, is that the right sample size? And were they really the right customers? And maybe we asked them on the wrong day. Whereas if you go and visit customers directly, if you go and spend time with them directly, even if, what, even if you don't like what you hear, you can't fail to understand that it is their truth. So I'll give you an example. We did a big bit of work in one of the big supermarkets in the UK a few years ago, and they were in quite a lot of trouble. So it was just the start of a turnaround. And we took their CEO to go and visit one of their brand new refurbished branches up in stores, up in Grimsby in the north of England. And we got the CEO to go shopping with an 80 year old widow. Uh, and she took him around this newly refurbished store and he was really proud of it. And it took her two hours to go around with him. And she told him every single thing that was wrong with the way that they would refurbished it. Every single thing. The fish counter was too high. She couldn't see the backboard where the ingredients were anymore. They got rid of the lady that gave her the recipes and told her what she should do with every single thing. So it was quite an eviscerating experience for him. And even if coming out of that, he says, well, you know, that's not statistically significant. He can't deny it's true. And it's true for how those people feel. So I think, I think really Jim, that this, that's kind of part of the problem is people don't want to do it because they're afraid of what they'll find out. 
uh, and afraid of some of those conversations because it's actually inconvenient to do it. And the status quo, it's safer to be, I think Daniel Kahneman talked about people, you can get people to do anything if they're surrounded by a group of like-minded thinkers. Well, in a big organization, the gravity is quite strong. You're surrounded by people that agree with that way. Just kind of keep the data coming in, just keep doing this way. We don't really want to peer over the parapet too much. If we do, actually, we might have to make some serious changes. It's a bit inconvenient. So I think that's what's at the heart of it, a lack of, a lack of real burning ambition to go and make things better for customers. That's really interesting to me. Uh, again, in the book that I mentioned, The Genius of Beats, he talks about how he had a, a variety of careers. He had a scientific education. And anyway, he was talking about um, becoming a music promoter. And he realized that all of the exec, I don't recall the label he was at, but all of the executives at the label were competing only with each other. They, they, they weren't out in the clubs listening to, oh, this might be like the next, whatever, the next Beatle, the next Stones. And rather, it was just this internal competition, literally. He, he made a funny joke. He's like, when one guy got a double pen set and everyone else only had one pen, everyone ran out and bought the double pen set. And it just seemed insane to me. One of the things that I've always done, well, not always, I actually learned this the hard way and we'll get into that in a minute, but that I've done for a long time is I try to push every decision in my companies down to the people who are actually doing the thing. Right. So when we were setting up O'Shaughnessy Asset Management, which we subsequently sold to Franklin Templeton, uh, the president of the organization and I were having lunch and he goes, you know, we have to decide on, you know, the trading software on the trading systems. And I looked at him and I went, Chris, we don't have to decide on anything. We have to go down, ask our traders and our portfolio managers, what do they want? Why is that so hard? It seems obvious. It made my life much easier. Yeah, I, it's exactly right. I mean, so in the, in the book, I've got a few examples of organizations that do this really well. One of them is AO.com. They're an wow. electrical retailer in the UK. And their CEO, John Roberts, he's an he's a inspirational guy. A fantastic story about how he set up the business based on a one pound bet in a pub in Manchester with his friend and, and all kinds of things. A wonderful, wonderful business, hugely customer led. And he talks all the time about walkabout management. You know, he says, I have to be down on the floor. I have to be with my drivers. I have to be in the contact center. I have to hear what's going on. For two reasons, I have to set the standards, but also I have to, they're the only people that can really tell me because as it comes, like you say, as it comes up the line, I'm not going to be told the truth. Everything's going to get given a sheen for me. You have to go out, you have to go out and do it. But again, I think, I think in part of it, I mean, I think what you said is brilliant. In part of it, it comes down to a pride thing. I think there's a lot of middle management and a lot of senior management that wouldn't want to do what you've described. Because they would feel in some way that, you know, well, it's my job to make the decision. Or if I look like I'm passing the decision on, then, you know, people will think, I don't know what I'm talking about, or I'm going to lose my pride. Rather than seeing the bigger picture about empowering your team, empowering your staff, empowering your colleagues. It, 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 again, I, I might just be an anomaly, but just, you know, that just seems so intuitively correct to me. Um, you know, uh, one thing I did learn, uh, when I started my first company was I would, when I would, when we would have a team meeting, I would speak first and then I would ask my colleagues and teammates for their opinions. And it was, it was a magical experience because they all reflected my opinion. <laughs> and then, and then I realized, oh, you're such an idiot. You've got to talk last, right? So I, I just, I, I guess the pride thing and the, and, and that I understand, but I sometimes kind of think, is that just a function of the size of the organization? I, I think it can be. So we, so one of my colleagues, Charlie Dawson, he wrote a brilliant book a couple of years ago called the customer Copernicus. And he's got this great analogy for being customer led and for organizations being like planets and with gravity. So if you think of an organization as a planet. And the customers are kind of floating around the outside. And uh, the people on the front line of the organization, they're kind of on the surface of the planet. And then the more senior you get, the more inside the planet you are, you know, the more inside the business you are. Effectively, there's more layers between you and the edge of the earth, the edge of your planet and where your customers are. And 
you can be customer led. You can get out and really understand. You can get in a rocket and fly off the, your planet and really understand what matters to those customers. But it's like gravity because this is just the way organizations and people work. It's an inbuilt human bias, this inside out thinking. So the gravity will eventually pull you back in. And the bigger the planet, the stronger the gravity. So when you're a startup and there's only four or five of you in the business, you've got your own little planet, but there's not that many layers and actually it's quite easy to kind of escape that gravity and stay close to customers. When you're a big bank and there's so many layers between you and, uh, and, and your customers, and also there's so many demands on your time, you know, if you're a bank CEO, you've got a lot of time with regulators and uh, investors and shareholders and stuff, you know, so many demands on your time. That gravity takes so much effort, unless it's really naturally built, so much effort. But more than that, all of the forces around you in the way most organizations work are driven to make you not go and speak to your customers. They're driven for you to be in meetings with your colleagues, the whole way organizations work. And, and what's interesting, when I looked at some of the organizations I studied, the likes of uh, Octopus, for example, in, in the UK, I looked to work there in the US as well. Actually, they've got kind of just quite a fundamental way of running their business. It's just very, very different. But it absolutely comes from the top. It's, you know, it's like Octopus, the CEO, right from when they were a startup, you know, he, he's quite happy to have his email published. Everyone can email him. And that's still true now. They've got 7 million customers in the UK. They're getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Still true. They've had to make some changes, but some of those fundamental principles are true. Similarly, with one of the rail companies I looked at in the UK, they insist that their senior managers live somewhere on that railway line. So they have to get their own train into work every day and they have to wear their, man, their name badge. And just that, just that rule is the thing that I think keeps them the most satisfied customer base in the UK in the rail network. Because they're getting first-hand direct experience with their own product and they're getting first-hand direct feedback on their own product every single day, whether they like it or not. And Alan Riley, the guy I spoke to there, he, he said, the more formal the forum, the less I learned. Because he said, we did all these focus groups and all these meet the manager events, but they were never useful. No one really told me anything. I learned everything I needed to on the 748 from Princess Risborough to London Bannington uh, every single morning. So it, it does need to be an organizational, and that's why I go on to talk about these enablers, an organizational ways of working that enable this. Otherwise, the natural way organizations currently work is to suppress that contact and take up senior management time with everything else that needs, that needs doing. I love that. The more formal the forum, the less I learned. That is so great. I will be stealing that just so you know. <laughs> um, the, uh, you know, we sort of had a similar uh, principle at uh, the firm I sold, O'Shaughnessy Asset Management. Uh, we all had to invest only in our own portfolios, right? That we offered our clients. And uh, I didn't get any pushback. Everyone was like, well, of, co of course we should. Like that just makes sense. Um, and, and what we try to do is because we are experiencing the same thing the client is, if we have investments in that particular strategy, uh, it makes you a good deal more empathetic, uh, if things are going poorly. And it also makes you, uh, a, a bit more willing to say, don't get overly excited <laughs> if things are going really, really great because you are having the experience much like the executive saying. Everything I needed was on that 748 train. Um, yeah. it, it seems to me, though, that there's this other thing. I, I have a little shorthand, uh, which is when I'm dealing with an organization, I, I do what I call a Bogon search. Are you familiar with uh, Douglas Adams' Hitchhiker's Guide? Oh, yeah. To the galaxy? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so the Bogons are the, are the galaxy's bureaucrats, and they speak in in a, you, you can't make your way through their word salads and everything is, that's not the way it's done. Everything's in the passive voice. They're quite funny actually. And, and like when I was starting O'Shaughnessy Ventures, uh, one of my colleagues said, well, what's the first rule? And I said, no bogots. <laughs> Meaning what, why is also, it seems to me, uh, communications, right? Corporate comms. They're horrible for the most part. They're, they're beyond horrible. Like everything is in the passive voice. It was decided, uh, you know, nameless, face, faceless automaton told me this, and I will now be informing you. And then, and we are a bit guilty of this in finance, even now, even as I try to cleanse the jargon, 
like you, you do develop these shorthand terms of art, right. That are useful when you're talking to your clients, but like that can be really, really challenging. Cause one thing I started to realize when I would go and talk to clients, I would use something like basis points. Right. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and I would get, I could tell by usually the man, uh, if it was a couple, usually the man, you could see on his face, he didn't know what basis points were. The wife would often, or the, his partner would often say, what are basis points? Is, 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 is it a function of male, female? Are, are men just loathe to say, hey, I don't know what that is. Would you tell me what that is? Yeah, it's so interesting, isn't it? So, so you know, similarly, my 12 years, my 12 years in banking, it was so interesting to see how many letters we wrote out to people that were just seemed to us to make sense. But when I showed them, I, I ended up showing everything to my wife. So before we sent it out, I would show it to my wife and I would say, does this make sense to you? Because she wasn't, you know, in any way working in banking or business, actually. And she would always be brilliantly brutal and tell me, no, this, and she, she actually was a speech therapist. She was very, very good at kind of going, this doesn't make sense. And, and again, it's that, that kind of inside out view where you just start using language that you're unaware of. But I think recently that's now been matched up by this slightly odd thing that's happening in organizations of being very, very defensive. And we've kind of gone from customer is always right to, no, the customer is probably wrong and they're probably trying to pull a fast one on us. So we need to be as defensive as possible. And that kind of legalese that's coming into so many of the letters that we're writing. But it, but it matters so much. And I think your, your point is absolutely right. It matters in terms of the customer experience because of the customers, we're getting a load of language that we don't understand. But that language is actually really powerful, going back to the point before about how organizations work. So one of the examples I use in the book is one of the broadband companies uh, in the UK. Uh, if you go on their website and you go to the Join Us page, you get invited to phone their acquisition setting. You know, because all of us as humans want to be acquired as much as we want to be retained. And you can just see these little clues starting to, starting to come out of this language. And in the book, I also talk about loyalty and we might talk about this later a bit about customer loyalty, not really, not really being a thing. But I think that the problem with that is again, the semantics of it, because actually when people say loyalty, what they're really talking about is customers just stay with them because they're staying useful. But as soon as people start using the word, oh, we have loyal customers, they stop trying. Because royalty suggests well, they're going to stay with us anyway. So all this language is really important. It's really interesting kind of how, how it works. But it is, again, this kind of interesting um, change in behavior that happens when people go into a meeting room or turn on a Zoom call and they stop writing like humans. Uh, one of the best examples I think I had about that and the difference is the show where we've come from to where, where we are now is when you get a complaint letter. When you've had a complaint, you get the response. And in the book, I talk about this letter from a suit company called Moss Bros. And it was 1951. And uh, he, the, the, the managing director of Moss Bros had received a complaint letter because they'd failed to um, deliver the wedding suits for someone's wedding on the day they were meant to. And there's this letter back to the managing director. And it says, words fail to express the humility in which I stand for how badly we've let you down today. And it's this really powerful letter. He's so sorry. Yet. At the bottom of the letter, it's interesting. He sends two checks, one check from Moss Bros and one personal check from, his, from himself because he's so sorry. Now, you compare that to now when you complain, and it's sorry for the inconvenience caused, or sorry if there was any inconvenience caused, or sorry if you felt there was any inconvenience caused, just followed by a whole load of text boxes. And even worse, just to ramble about this for a bit more, uh, a friend of mine yesterday told me a story about Uber Eats and, and about uh, he... he ordered the Chinese and he'd ordered roast duck and the uh, hoisting sauce hadn't turned up with the roast duck. So he messaged Uber Eats and said, can you give me a refund on that? And the long story short is they kept saying no. But in all these automated responses that they got, they'd be like five paragraphs long. And four of the paragraphs would be basically saying how much they cared about customers. It was, so it would start by saying, thank you so much for your, your, uh, your contact. At Uber Eats, we take customer experience very, very seriously. We're so sorry you've had to contact us. We take on your feedback, blah, 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 four, par four paragraphs of that. And then unfortunately we won't be able to give you a refund for this item. Thank you very much for getting in touch. We do do value your feedback. And, and it's just this, like, this kind of just really odd, like it, it's almost like a chat GPT is just writing things. It's just, it's not human. But the question really, I think is, do you blame the human that's doing that? Or do you blame the system around the human that's not letting them feel like they can act like they're human? 
And the language just becomes a part of that. Do people feel they're allowed to say what they really want to say, feel they're allowed to write what they really want to write, or do they feel they're going to get in trouble? Then the defensive thing, you know, the good guy greens about risk savvy, the defensive decision is to just write in the way you're taught to write because you won't get in trouble for that. And I think that may be at the heart of a lot of what's going on here. Yeah, I think that that's a really good point because, um, you know, uh, back to the Roman times, I can't remember which worthy said it, but um, it was along the lines of the, the, the more laws, uh, the, the, the weaker the society. And, and when, you, when you complicate uh, things uh, from a legal perspective, right? Um, you know, you, you get situations like here in New York City, the, the manual that uh, public school teachers have to read and comply with is this thick. And for those of you who are listening and not watching, I'm doing like three phone books here. And, and any normal human, when they read this, say, this is utterly insane. Why? Why are you not willing to let teachers like comfort a child who's in obvious distress? And, and like America tends to, we've got a lot of problems. We've got a lot of great things, but we also are much more of a litigious society than, than other societies. And so what's happened is they, these, these rules have run amok and people have forgotten what, what's at the base, right? At the base of a teacher student relationship if it's going to work, is the humanity, the, the interaction that those two can engage in. And I, I just wonder, it, like, your book offers many, many solutions, but it, it, does this come back down to a size question? Because one thing I found myself as I was reading your book, I loved it, and I'm thinking, but does it scale? Is, can 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 this type of thing like scale to uh, an HSBC or a city or, or is that impossible? Yeah, I think it's a brilliant question, a very fair question. And what I've thought about myself, because I'm aware that the, the organizations in the book are, are not quite that size, you know, they're not, you know, we, and we have seen this when you, when you look in, again, if I look at say um, UK, for example, you look at like a Tesco, if you go to Singapore and you look at BBS. There are examples of big organizations that do this well. So actually, I think the question is less of it, can it scale and more of can it scale forever? Because all of the companies that get big and do it really well, they all tip at some point. They all have a natural cycle at some point. And often that cycle is when uh, there's changes in the leadership team and changes in priorities. And there's a bit of pressure. And they just start to do something a little bit more that's about the money and the shareholders, a little bit, just a little bit. And then they do a little bit more and a little bit more. And all of a sudden it's unraveling because the belief has gone and, and, and the approach has gone. The question I think though is, there's a version of the answer, which is now, which is I think it can scale, but I think it ticks after a while. But actually I think it's a different question for what will that look like in the next 10 to 15 years? Because I think a lot of the problems that have been, that have come about, have come about because for all of the good of all the technology we've had in the last 20 years, that has led organizations to believe they can really cut to the bone the costs on their customer experience. Like this holy grail of automation is going to come along and really help digitize the experience. And everyone's going to be really delighted and we're all going to give a service like Amazon. But the truth is that hasn't happened. For all the good that that's brought and all the great things we can do, and that has improved in the customer experience, we've done it at the expense of that emotional experience. But what I think we're seeing now is a new generation of organizations coming through that are now going to start to grow to that size that have grown and started with that technology there right from the start. Whereas in the past 20 years, it's been organizations that were pretty much already there, but they were then trying to fit, fit the technology within their business. So someone like Octopus, you know, their, their whole business is built on this fantastic IT system they've got called Kraken that, that really helps them put the customer at the heart of what they do and build their team structure around what they do. So every, uh, every time they get another 50,000 customers, they build in another customer service team and that customer service team looks after that 50,000 customers and their system allows them to do that. And they can keep doing that. They can keep doing that because their cost model works. So look, that's never going to push their cost exponentially higher. So their model continually works. Every 50,000 customers, another team of 10. Every 50,000 customers, another team of 10. But because they started from that point 
rather than the incumbents trying to, trying to catch up. So I think the picture in 10 years' time might look quite different. I do think in 10 years, you could have companies of significant size that are doing this in, in this way. The HSBCs of the world is a slightly different question because there's an overall question of are they, are they just too big <laughs> as organizations anyway? And actually, do you have to just manage those as a series of smaller organizations? So the UK HSBC business could do it and the Hong Kong HSBC business could do it. Uh, can it do it at a global level? That's incredibly difficult with all of the moving parts. So then you're, you've essentially got a tree here like 20 different businesses and some of those wouldn't, some of those won't, I think. Um, but you see, it's a, it's a really interesting question and one that I need to do more exploration on as well, I think. The, uh, you have a showcase of the companies and you've mentioned several of them. Um, and, uh, one of the things that I was taken away, uh, or I took away as I was reading it is, uh, I have a friend here in Manhattan who is a doctor, a radiologist, and, uh, he's relatively young. And worked at a hospital with its horrible bureaucracy um, and rose rather rapidly um, to be on the committee that runs the hospital. And he opened his meeting, uh, his first meeting, with a list that he had compiled of all the simple things that were wrong that would be easy to correct. And, and then he told me, he's a great storyteller too. And he, and he told me literally you could have heard a flea fart in that room because of the reaction. And, and, and he was like, what, what's going on? You know, what, what did I, did I say something wrong? What did and, and so the, the chairman, uh, of the group asked him to stay after the meeting. And, and he said to him, don't ever, ever do that again. The systems that we have are, we have them for a reason and they, we are so hyper-regulated, et cetera. Well, the cut to the reaction, he resigned and but, he went, yeah. he, he went home and he sat with his wife and he said, get your friends to tell you everything they hate about doctors and hospitals. And literally they had like 10 pages on yellow legal sheets. And he started a series of incredibly successful radiology centers. How? By addressing everything on that list. And, and so many of them were just very simple. Like, and it actually comes up in your findings as well. Uh, doctors at that time weren't giving their cell phone numbers to their patients. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and so one of his things was, no machine will ever pick up. So he has a 24 hour answering service with a human and he leaves his phone on and he goes, now granted, I'm a radiologist. I don't get too many 3 a.m. calls. He said, but when I do, I answer the phone. And he said, like, literally I've gotten letters and emails and texts from clients saying, I recommend you to everyone. Yeah. Is it, yeah. is it really just, is, is it really just that, if we start over and, 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 and start like from first principles, can that help? Well, it can, it can. And, I, and I think, yeah, actually what, another thing that's quite interesting about what you've just said on the question before is, you know, there's a colleague angle to this as well, that, you know, doing this isn't just making things better for customers, you know, be, being restricted by the rules, having to speak in a certain way, you know, colleagues aren't happy with that. People aren't happy with that. You know, colleague satisfaction at work is, is reducing as well. Because people feel like they can't express themselves, they can't be themselves. They, you know, can you imagine being the person on the other end of the phone that's in the kind of what well, I would, but I could, but I can't. You know, like you know, you know, it's it's an awful place to be for for both people on there. And and I do think when you really when you really strip it back, and I was quite keen, I suppose, in the book not to make it too formulaic because that is hard. It really is just just if in doubt, be that be that human person. Um, you know, I'd say, uh, there is there's a story that's not in the book because it only happened recently about this that I think I think kind of shows this balance to your point of first, first principles, but also about how this is just very bad and costly for companies anyway. Just at Christmas, the the, um, the team here decided we were going to do black tie for the Christmas do, which I kind of reticently went along with, um, only because I'd you know, been quite a while since I've worn black tie and I thought I'm going to have to buy a bow tie. So last minute, I decided to buy a bow, buy a bow tie, join in with the fun. But it was only two days before the Christmas day, so I had to order it online, next day delivery. I paid extra, £7 extra for next day delivery. 
And uh, the next day, that thing happened where the delivery driver drove up outside my house, looked in my window, kind of looked at me, and then just drove off. And then I got the email straight away saying, oh, sorry, we missed you. You were out. Uh, and obviously, I was fairly annoyed. So I, I phoned up the company. And the first thing that happened is the company, that I get the automated message saying, I'm really sorry, we've got unexpectedly high call volumes at the moment. Okay, it could be a while. And so I wait on the phone for half an hour. And eventually I get through and I say, look, this is what happened. I need to make sure it's delivered tomorrow, but also I'd, I'd like the seven pound back because I paid for next day delivery and it's not been delivered next day. And she says, um, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I'm not sure we're going to be able to do that because, you know, we're going to deliver it tomorrow. And I was like, yeah, but it's seven pound for next day. She's like, okay, I'll see what I can do. So she goes off five minutes later and she comes back. We can offer you five pounds as a gift voucher. And I said, and I said, well, that's, and, and the thing is my wife, I'm in, I'm in the kitchen and I do this for a living, obviously. And my wife kind of hears my reaction and she goes, oh, here we go. I'm like, right. I'm in this house. I'm like, well, I said, well, no, that's firstly it's seven pound, not five pound. And secondly, I don't want a gift voucher because I can't buy anything from your shop for five pounds. So I'm going to have to spend more money. And, um, and she said, well, uh, I'm sorry. That's the, that's the max that we're able to do. And I was like, go and ask your boss. So she goes up, comes back and she says, okay, we can give you seven pounds as a gift voucher. And by now I've been on the phone 45 minutes. And I said, no, I'm sorry. That's not enough now. I don't want a gift voucher. I want money. And you know, it's, it should be more than that, you know? And she went, that is the maximum our IT system is able to give you. And this is one of the biggest retail companies in the UK. And so we have this back and forth and, and then. I end up saying, uh, I said, I want to speak to your manager. And she says that we're really busy. I warn you, if you wait on the phone, it could take up to 20 minutes. And so obviously I said, I'll wait. I'm going to wait. So she goes off. 10 minutes later, she comes back. And she says, okay, I've spoken to my manager. We can give you 10 pounds in cash. And I was like, okay, fine. I'll take the 10 pounds in cash. And you wonder why they've got unexpectedly high call volumes. But it's a great example where it, it's awful for me. Like brilliant. What, what, what the best companies would do there was automatically refund me the money because they know they've got the system automatically refund me the money. So that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is that it's bad for the colleague because she's having to be on the phone for an hour and 10 minutes whilst I'm, you know, getting a bit angry and obviously she knows the right answer. And then the third thing is it's really expensive for the company an hour, an hour and 10 minutes on the phone. So these kind of things. You get these examples all of the time, bad for colleague, bad for customer. And if you do go back to those first principles, if you do go back to that really, really simple way of just doing the right thing, doing the common sense approach, it's going to get you a really long way. I think. I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, the company I run right now, which honestly ventures is completely globally dispersed and literally, uh, it, it, you know. People get to do their own thing, right? We we meet and and do monthly, but but there those are more like to share our excitement about what we're working on, and yeah. and v- very little about any command and control structure from above. I you know I I'm a inveterate rabbit hole diver and and I love complex adaptive systems and like emergence comes from below, it does not come from above. And, and I just, it seems like such a simple principle to me. Um, and, and hearing that story reminds me of like, I very rarely call. Right. So I, and, and one time, uh, my wife was like, well, that's outrageous. I'd ordered something and it didn't come. And she's like, are, are, aren't you going to call? And I went, no, I, I, it'll just put me into a horrible mood. And, and, and then I said to her, you know what? God damn it. It's like so many of these companies that we're dealing with are like grifters and, and like you wonder why people don't want to work at them. You wonder why people don't want to use them because they feel like they're being fleeced. They feel like, you know, that a con person uh, or a con artist is the one they're corresponding. Yeah. And they, and they forget that we're paying to be a customer. I mean, this is is the incredible thing. Like with, if it was a free service, like, you know, if it's like a Facebook thing or a Twitter thing, like Elon Musk, you go, well, it's a free, it's free. So I haven't got a play, but, but I'm, I'm paying, I'm paying a service. I'm paying my money for it. So, so AO.com, I mentioned and John Roberts, brilliant. What makes them brilliant is it, the team is so empowered. His team is so empowered. 
to do the right thing for a customer. And their customer experience strategy is two rules. It's treat people in the way that you'd like your grandmother to be treated and make decisions that would make your mum proud. And that's it. And he says, every six, mums and grand, that's all he talks about, mums and grand, mums and grand. And it's one of these companies, everyone's kind of got a budget to do just the right thing. It's not like a target. It's not like have 200 pounds. It's just, just know you can do the right thing. If you do something and we think, well, that probably was a bit much, we'll have a chat about it afterwards, but you will never get in trouble if you thought he was doing the right thing. Make decisions. And, you know, to your point about scale, that means as a business, they, 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 they're able to grow and scale because they don't have all these rule books. But there's two things I think are interesting. Firstly, is John also sets about to make sure that the team have everything they need to be successful. So with the delivery drivers, every morning they get in, the, they get in their van. Their van has been fully cleaned overnight. It's got fresh bottles of water in because they're going to be driving around quite a lot. And they pack the van in the order that the deliveries need to come out. They do all of that for the driver. It's really easy for the driver. But secondly, it allows these little kind of moments of magic that you can't process map to occur. So he tells a great story about um, one of their delivery drivers phoned up a customer, was delivering a fridge, phoned up a customer and said, I'm going to be with you in half an hour. And it was the customer's son that answered. And, um, and he said, oh yeah, that's completely fine. Just so you know, it's my parents' wedding anniversary. So there's quite a few more people around the house. You can still come, but just so you know, it might be a bit busy. So, so on the way, the delivery driver just stops at the local florist, picks up a plant in yeah, AO's colours are green and white. So he picks up a plant in brown colours, arrives at the house, knocks on the door. Hello, I'm from AO. My name's so and so. Here's the fridge. And by the way, happy anniversary. And that's a really, really tiny thing. But that story has gone around the company. That story will go around that friendship group. It's cost them. 20 pounds, 10 pounds for the cost of a plant, almost nothing. But you can't, you can't process map it. You can't say in this situation, do this. If you phone up and there's an anniversary, do that. You just have to let the people be human. Now you compare that to most organizations where it's cut costs, do the thing. It's all about efficiency, get the job done. Don't waste one single minute going to pick up a pot plant. But what you lose, what you gain from that compared to what you lose from that, what you lose from that humanity. So ultimately, if you hire the right people, and you hire people that naturally want to give a great service and then give them the freedom and the support to do that, you're going to have a great experience. You don't need a big complex strategy. And I think that can scale if your recruitment and your HR part is really strong. And that's why that, those two sides, the HR side and the, the, the customer experience side, need to be really arm in arm rather than separate parts of the organization because they're so dependent on each other. But yeah, I think John and AODOC is a brilliant example of, of how you can build that empowerment in, but it starts from the manager, the leader being there and giving that permission to, to be empowered and make the right decision. Yeah. And it just seems to me like so much of this, like, for example, uh, we don't, we don't have any complex, uh, you know, uh, mission statement that everyone needs to adhere to. We basically say, look, we're going to play positive sum games with positive sum players. That's what we want to do. <laughs> and, and like you, you, you do that the way you think is going to be best for you to do that. And, you know, uh, we've, we've had people who on the team who just completely unexpectedly did something really cool and, um, like delighted. I have gotten so many emails and texts from people when a team member like goes out of their way to, you know, I, I was trying to figure out how to do this fellowship application and I couldn't figure it out. And, and then somebody actually called me. I didn't even, call, I, I just said, like, uh, this is too complicated. And I got a call and that blew me away. And, and he walked me through the, the thing. And, and I didn't ask him to do that. He just did it because that's the way we want to run things. It, it, isn't it interesting, though, that when those kind of things happen now, it's like a nice surprise. Exactly. Just the way it's, it's like if you phone a company and you get straight through, you're like, oh, wow. Like we, we've allowed, and, and this I think is a really important point, we've allowed our standards to fall. We've allowed ambition to, to fall. I talk about these five kind of enablers and the, these ways of working these companies have. And the major one of that is ambition. All of the companies I study that do this well, they do it because they really care. They really want to do it. They've got high standards. They're not accepting, oh, it's fine to have people on half, for half an hour on a phone. You know, I did, I once tried to get an organization to change their metrics to change their average call waiting time metric to human lives wasted 
because I thought, well, that will sharpen their mind a bit. If you go, well, actually, if we count up all the time people have been on hold to us this year and convert that into human lifetimes, like that will be pretty dramatic to kind of, to kind of show people. But this, this ambition is really important. But the, the other point I just wanted to make on what you said there, Jim, is because I think, I think this is important as well. Even though it's called the human experience and we're talking a lot about frontline people, so much of what we're talking about is still true for where your experience doesn't involve any humans, where it is still digital. So your point earlier about language, that's so important. If you're on an app, if you're on a website, if you're in an email, it doesn't have to involve an actual human. It can just be the way things have been written, the way things have been designed to take account of the fact that people want certainty and like certainty in life. You know, the way you can make things, you know, take it out of view to know whether something's going to be complex or not. Have you got too much choice? You know, I often, you know, tell a story about going to buy a train ticket in the UK, and I'm sure it's the same in the US, and you go to the machine and you get like 11 different options for the train ticket. And you're like, well, functionally, that's good. But emotionally, that's a disaster. And I'm going to get on the train and just presume I get told that I've got the, I've got the wrong ticket. And, and the, the other point I just wanted to loop around with that is, so it's not just the human on the front line, it's not just the digital, but this does have to be the organization. It does have to start with how you design your experience. So your point actually about these cool ideas that come out. So Octopus Energy, they, they do a thing called Friday night dinner. And it'll be interesting to see whether this can really scale. But it, it can at the moment. Friday night, five o'clock, everyone on the company joins a Slack call. Everyone, everyone piles in, everyone joins. And they just talk about what's been good this week, what's been annoying. And uh, they did this one call about a year or so ago. And one of the frontline teams said, I've had so many complaints about our whole music this, this month, this week. Like people are really annoyed, it's so boring. And someone else said, Well, why can't we just like personalize the whole music, give people what they want? And an engineer kind of popped in and said, Well, we can do an API with Spotify. That might work. And someone said, yeah, but how would that make it relevant? And then someone else from like the risk department said, oh, we have people's date of birth. We have to ask people their date of birth to join the energy company. And then someone else said, oh, well, I've got, I read this article that most people connect with the music when they're about 14. So the music they hear when they're about 14 is the music. And within half an hour, this idea had spun up that was, well, when people phone up, why don't we play the song that was number one when they were 14 years of age? And that's what you now get. If you phone Octopus and now yeah, there's 6 million customers in the UK. If you phone up Octopus and they've got your date of birth, you'll get the song. I'll mine is the Fuji's. You'll get the song that was number one while you were 14 years of age on your 14th birthday. And it's, and it's brilliant. But the point there is everything we're talking about, about being a human, it's not just about delivering the service because there the being a human is letting people come up with ideas, letting people share their perspectives, letting people share their thoughts. You know, there was no managers or leaders involved in that conversation. They spun it up in a week. Within a week from that call, it was like, it was brilliant. But that, for that humanity needs to go all the way through the organization to create the experience, not just letting the people on the front line do good things, if that makes sense. It makes total sense. And it also leads to, I, I think that uh, we, we, um, we other technology um, and, and we put it over here and we look at it as monolithic, you know, but there's only so much you can do with it. And I'm just the opposite of that. I think that you can use technology. That is your example was like the best example of this. Why not do the things that the tech can easily do if you're thinking like a human, right? And like, oh my God, I can't believe, I love this song. And it goes from being pissed off that you're waiting on hold to not wanting to miss the end of the song, right? <laughs> Yeah, it's and, exactly and that. I, yeah, Ikea, did, just to say Ikea, which you phone up Ikea, they play ABBA Gold, the entire ABBA album, which is really annoying because I, I rang up Ikea and I was really annoyed with them about something. But I couldn't help to be like just singing along to Waterloo and Dancing Queen. I just couldn't help it. So by the time I got through, I was in a great mood and that annoyed me. But anyway, sorry. Yeah. Well, one of the other things that you advocate is what you call structured flexibility. Uh, and we talked a little bit about that. Um, with the uh, delivery driver picking up the uh, the plant for um, the client that uh, they were delivering uh, a, a refrigerator to on their uh, anniversary, uh, how do you how do you inculcate that um, that kind of attitude? In, and let's let's stay with a like an eight million customer uh, company because it's pretty easy if you're a boutique and 
you know, that's why people often are patronizing you anyway, because they much prefer that. But like with these larger organizations, is, is there some kind of way that you can tell who's going to do that and who's not? It, it, when you say who's going to do it, do you mean within your, um, within the company, within, within the individual? No, within the company. Like, is there, is there something to look for when you're hiring people? Like to, this person's probably much more likely to say, stop and pick up a plant and, and this person isn't. Yeah. I think, I think there's, I think it's just a generally a huge thing about natural curiosity. And I think natural curiosity and natural creativity are the two things that are probably going to keep us ahead of AI actually, as humans anyway. But, but they're the two things I think are clues to people that end up giving a great customer experience for a couple of reasons. If you're curious, then you just want to know more about the customer. So, you know, I was working with a company recently with their contact centers to try and help them have more human conversations. And they went and sat me with two of their best people. And because they always do that. And uh, I, uh, you know, it's a mortgage conversation and customer rings up, beep goes in the ear. And the customer says, yeah, I just need to ring up because uh, we just found out we're expecting another charge. We need to move house. Can you help me work out what I can do next? And the person says, yeah, great. I'll go and look at some rates for you. We can work all that out. Don't you worry. 10 minutes later, the next call comes in. Yeah, hi, um, our house has just fallen through. The house chain has just fallen through. We had an offer on the house, but now we're not going to be able to buy it. You know, so I'm going to need to cancel the mortgage rate I have. Yeah, no worries. I can help you do that for you. Now, functionally, both of those gave a good experience, but neither of them were curious enough to kind of go, I'm really sorry about that. Tell me more about that. How are you feeling about that? The reason for that was because they were too busy looking at their screens where all this information pops up. So you've got this natural curiosity that enables people to actually go, I'm not going to look at that for a minute. I'm just going to talk to you. I just want to have the conversation. I just want to speak to you and just find out more about you. So straight away, if you've got people that are curious, they'll have better conversations. And that's, that's the same in life, isn't it? It's like you said at the start, we had a bit of a chat. We're both curious people. I was interested to know about your Easter. You're interested to know about mine. That's just how it is. That's just the conversation. Whereas if you're not a curious person, you'll just follow that kind of functional route and you'll just do what you're told to, to do. And the second element about creativity is then you're interested in finding out new and better ways to do things. And so that might be that you follow what you're told to do, but it might be that you go, actually, if we could do it a little bit differently for you, I think I can work out a way that might help you, Mr. or Mrs. Customer. That means, because quite often when the customer phones up, what they ask for isn't actually the thing that they need because they don't know, particularly if you're looking at complex financial products, they're asking for the thing they think they need, but they need you to be curious to ask them more questions to find out what you really need. And then they need you to be creative to help them work out how you can get to the right answer. So they're the two traits that I look for. And then within that structured flexibility, all you really need to say is, well, the call, you know, your call has to broadly be this length, maybe, maybe not, you know, but within it, you have to tick off these four or five things. Um, and actually, I, you know, my own experience of that is when I was a branch manager, we used to say to our, our um, premier managers who looked after our high net worth customers, in the first meeting, you have to have the account open, the savings account open, sign up to internet banking, this, this, and this. And it really annoyed customers because they were like, this is going to take hours, I don't want to do it. Then we switched and we said, okay, to our premier managers, within the first month, these things have to happen. Up to you how you do it. You can do it in the first meeting, you can have three meetings, you can do it phone calls, whatever you want. And customer satisfaction went through the roof because then you just let their natural curiosity and creativity work out what the best thing was for the customer. And then it went from there within that structure rather than being far more formulaic to your point about Romans and rules. Yeah. And that, you know, that's part of my thesis about like all of the old ways of doing things are collapsing. And I say for the most part, good riddance, um, because, uh, I also believe passionately that curious, uh, open-minded people are just going to naturally be better. They're going to be better. Uh, that's what I look for in everyone that I add to the team at my company. I want people who are super curious, who are going to be proactive and, and, and figure something out. And you know what? It's great because like that empowers them to be even more curious, right? When they, when they hear back from me, like, Hey, Atman, cool that you called that, you know, it wasn't, uh, that wasn't convenient to your time in India. And yet you, you did that. I, I really appreciate that. And like, yeah. it just seems so 
straightforward to me. And and if like, I, is it is it the mindset? What is what is blocking people? Well, I'll give, I'll give you one of my favorite stories. Uh, I was going to say from the book, but actually probably from my life actually, which I think really drives home the, the point with this. So we, we moved house about <clears throat> five years ago and I wanted to buy one of those big comfortable reading chairs. Yeah, you know, I'd obviously forgotten temporarily I had two small children. So the chances of me sitting in it and reading it were <laughs> basically zero anyway. <laughs> but we went to, went to visit a big furniture store and they had, the, the day we got there, we didn't know, the day we got there, they had a half price ex display furniture sale on. And there was still this big yellow chair and I thought that's the one I want. And it was half price, you know, hundreds of pounds. Off, that's what I'm going to have. The only problem was I'd driven there with my wife and my son, quite a small car, loads of kids stuff, car seat. Well, I'm not going to be able to get that in the car. So I went up to the guy behind the till and I said, um, look, I really want to buy this chair today. Can I buy it and then get it delivered? And he said, no, it's ex display furniture. So you have to, you have to find a way of taking it. We won't deliver stuff that's kind of half price. I was like, okay, kind of fair enough. Bit annoying, but okay. So I had a bit of a thing. I was like, okay, there's got to be a way around this. <laughs> so I went up to him again and I said, can I take the chair out to the car, which is in their car park just outside? Can I take the chair out to the car, see if I can fit it in? If I can, I'll buy it. And if not, I'll just bring it back in. So he goes upstairs, he asks his manager, he comes back down and he says, no, you can only take the chair off the premises once you've bought it. I said, okay, can I uh, buy the chair, take it out, try and fit it in the car. And if it doesn't fit, come back in, get a refund. He goes upstairs, asks his manager, come back down. No, no refunds on next display furniture. Okay. I said, so can I, can I take the chair, uh, buy the chair? Can I then leave it here for an hour while I drive my family home, empty the car, come back, pick it up. Goes upstairs, asks his manager, comes back down. No, as soon as you bought the chair, you must take it off the premises immediately. And at this point, my son, who's four at the time, is jumping up and down on this chair, shouting at anyone else that comes near it, like, go away, this is our chair, you know. And I feel like I'm in one of those fox, chicken, bag of grain, trying to get across a river, but there's an answer in here somewhere, but I can't work it out. Anyway, eventually I decided to risk it. I said, okay, I'm just going to buy it and I'll leave my family here. I'll clear out the car and I'll, I'll pump my computer up later and I'll try and get it in somehow. And this guy, he's like 21, big muscles, everything I'm not. And uh, I said to him, can you at least help me carry it to the car, which is just outside your door? And he's like, yeah, 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 no problem at all. No problem at all. Although I can only carry it to the door because I'm not insured to carry it outside of the premises. So true to his word, he carries it to the door, puts it down. Him and his colleague stand at what? While me and my wife, who's four foot ten, try and get it over to the car park while my son was playing chicken with all these other cars. It was the most ridiculous situation I've ever been. And the thing, the thing is with this, that as well as the fact that everybody knows this is a ridiculous situation, everyone. But the thing is, to your point, I'm firstly, I'm trying to buy a chair. I'm trying to give them my <laughs> money. I'm, not, I'm trying to give you money to a product that you clearly want to get rid of because you've got it on sale. So like, there's something should happen here. But at no point from his side or from the manager, this magical manager that was hitting upstairs that didn't come down at any point during this. At no point was there any curiosity or any creativity to try and go, right, I see the outcome you're trying to get to, Mr. Customer. You're trying to buy this chair and you've got a small car that's full. Let's work out together your different options. It was just this back and forth of no, 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 no. And it was, it was yeah, a remarkable situation. I think that's a, that, that really showcases for me the, the problem with this, if you have restrictive rules and humans that aren't allowed to be human, and if you can just open that freedom up a little bit, if you can tell people right from the start, we want you to be curious, we want you to be creative, we want you to be sensible because we're running a business and this is the kind of framework and let me, let me help you understand what we're in, but go and be your natural, creative, curious self. You're going to get far more good experiences than you are bad. And even if you do get a few things that go wrong, they'll be vastly outweighed by the positive impact you'll be having on customers and by the money you'll be saving anyway. Uh, as I was listening to the story, I was reminded of Monty Python's classic skit with the dead parrot, where, where he brings the parrot back. This parrot is deceased. Yeah, this is an ex-parrot. This is an ex-parrot, yeah. <laughs> but it seems to me, like, the, the idiocy of this, right, is that, like, we, we've done a ton of studies on which companies survived the longest, which, what are the attributes of those com companies, you know, quantitatively and qualitatively? 
And one of the things that you find is agility, right? The ability to, to do, to break those ridiculous rules. There's a high correlation with how successful and how long that company goes on. It would seem to me that this is the ultimate aligned interest of the owners of that company, right? Let's be agile. If that's one of the things that works, is there, is there like a hangover from, um, you know, I, I often say that Taylorism was one of the worst things to happen in, especially this country, but UK too. Um, and, and it infected everything and it infected government and it infected, uh, corporations and schools and everything. And, and it clearly doesn't work. And I, m- maybe I'm just an idiot. Are there not people like starting new companies and looking at these old companies and saying, we're just going to destroy them? Yeah, I, I think it's such an interesting, it, it's really interesting to me. I need to do a lot more work on it and thought on it. I was talking about this at lunchtime, actually, about where, where this is coming from. You know, I, I've talked about the figures in the US, the, the um, the, the, I think it's called the customer rage survey. I need to double check my, my wording on that. But, you know, in 1972, when it started, 36% of US customers said they had a problem with a company that year. And now the figure is like 78%. I mean, it's, it's exponential. It was, it was only 58% in 2017. And I, I suppose I've kind of got a couple of hypotheses. One is that, that you come out into financial crash and you've got a generation of people that are now coming into middle management positions who have kind of been brought up thinking organize, big organizations are just really bad and evil and, and inefficient. And actually, they don't care about customers and, and they have to cut costs as well. So as well as having the actual thing about trusting, trusting big business falling, they have to have kind of seven, eight years of cutting costs to kind of keep going. And that's really dented people's expectations and ambitions of what good experience looks like. And I think a lot of that might be a play in terms of what people and lead those leaders now in organization think they should be doing to think think what good what good looks like. So I think there's an element of that. I think there's an element of organizations just really, you know, like, in fairness to organizations, like so many of us, really adjusting to this new world. So if you look at social media and the impact that's had on politics and on relationships and on discussion and on discourse and on mental health, we're all still adjusting to that as a new technology. And, you know, I launched the first mobile app for HSBC in the UK, and it was only 10 years ago, you know, so it's still, it's still quite a short time where we'd gone from everyone goes to branches to no one goes to branches, right? Your whole business model is flipped upside down within a decade. It is, you know, it is a huge change and that's true across every industry and every company. And it's so easy for us to forget, I think, the scale of that change in what is still quite a short period of time. And. The impact that's probably still having on on organizations, particularly big organizations. I think the thing that I both love and disappoint me a bit with startups is so many of the startups really do take on the organizations and really do challenge them. And they're really coming up with great new ways to do things. And Octopus is a brilliant example of that. My my challenge I have with some of the startups that disappoints me is how many of them do it without making a profit. And so they come in and they get, you know, capital and they that and they enables them to uh, do things in a different way. And then after three or four years, they start getting asked, well, actually, you need to start turning a profit. And they've, they've effectively built their business model in such a way that doesn't allow them to make a profit. And then you start to see this with Uber and Deliveroo and even lots of Netflix. There's so many organizations that start to have a massive impact on the rest of the industry and start to force the rest of the industry to cut their costs to compete. But they're not actually doing it in a, in a profitable way. So we've got a cardo here in the UK that the big food delivery service had a great COVID because it's online only completely having to challenge or completely challenging the way all the other supermarkets deliver, but then obviously they're just getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger each year. And I think that there's something around that on the business side that's behind that as well. That I do have some sympathy with for business leaders who are being forced to change their business model and cut costs to compete with organizations that are starting up and taking their customers. But the playing field's kind of not really even there in a way. So you will know far more about that than I would, Jim. But I just think there's something, there's a few bits coming together from the last 15 years, whether it's new technology, whether it's um, the, the, the impact of the global financial crisis, you know, a few different things coming together, the way venture capital has come through, 
that is maybe causing this storm of organizations that if they want to do the right thing, just feel like they just, their hands are tied and they can't do it. Maybe. Yeah, actually, that's a really good point. The, uh, the whole, um, you know, it seems to be another one of the knock-on effects of zero interest rate policy maintained for too long. Because uh, essentially, you bring up Uber. It's a great example. Subsidize. Who, who isn't going to love a black car service that costs you less than a taxi? Uh, oh, gosh, where do I sign up? Right. And then when suddenly Uber needs to make money, uh, it's a whole different thing. So I totally buy into that. I always try. We focus a lot on on new companies and startups now. And one of the things that I always look for is, OK, is there actually a business model here that can allow for all those things, but also make money because you're not doing anyone any favors if you get them used to like a, a, a premium service delivered at a cut rate cost? Well, of course, everyone's going to love that. That doesn't make it, it makes great sense. You know, Rory Sutherland again, though, one of the things that he mentioned to me, which I really I hadn't thought of. And, and like, I love the way he thinks. Right. Because he says, you know why Uber this is several years ago. Do you know why Uber has this market capitalization it has. And he took out his phone and he showed me the map of the car and yeah. it, uh, how long it was going to take to get to you. And like that, that to me was a brilliant use of new tech, right? But even with that, and even with all of that brilliance, if you don't have a business model that can actually make money, you, you're not doing anyone any favors. Yeah, exactly. And the guys at Fifty Map are actually one of the other companies I study, and they talk about the blue dot moment. They talk about the moment that you were able to look at a map and see the blue dot and know where you were. That changed everything because then everything, when it came to kind of direction planning, travel planning, everything was a whole different ball game then. Because you weren't just looking at a static map and trying to work out where you were and where you were going. You had the map that showed you exactly where you were, and it was a real. A real change so uh, you, it is those moments like you say that um that people can then build belief in that kind of said this is why this can be something different but you've got to be able to do it in a way that's sustainable and if not you've got whole industries that are going to be creaking and ultimately it's customers that pay the price ultimately because the customer service falls down and reduces it, exactly I, I on that i have a friend actually his episode is up right now alex danko he's a big wig up at shopify um, and, and one of his more unusual, uh, positions, at least I thought, so I want to get your view on this. He, he thinks that frictionless customer experiences are not right. He thinks that customers actually prefer a little bit of friction in the process. What, what do you think about that? Yeah, I completely agree. I completely agree with that. Um, I've got a friend who uses an analogy at the, he says, you know, uh, riding a bike's great, but you wouldn't want a frictionless bike. There's times when you want to touch the brakes and you want the brakes to work. And I, I really, I really, I really agree. Um, about, about three weeks ago, I went to an event at Wembley Stadium and uh, I was on the train back afterwards. And just outside Wembley, they've got one of the uh, Amazon Go shops where, you know, you go in and out without, uh, without things. And it was fascinating on the train on the way home because it had been a big event, big packed train. All these people started talking about Amazon Go because one of the ladies on the train was holding in a, an Amazon Go bag and uh, they didn't know each other. And it was like sitting in a focus group. So I was just like being quiet and listening and watching. And all of them were saying the same thing, which is like, oh, I just don't like walking out without knowing. Like, I don't like walking out without knowing I've got a bit of certainty that it's gone through properly or that someone knows or they all had different variations of the same thing, but it all came back to. I just want that little bit of certainty just to know. So I think there's one thing around that where you need some sort of bit of friction just to feel confident it's done. The other version is that I think you want to know that people are taking it seriously. And so if I was, I don't know, if I was doing an investment, for example, and it was like a million pound investment, if it, if that's, if that's too easy, I just think, oh, is that, is that secure? Like if I could just open an app without any security and just send a million pounds, not that I've got a million pounds. But that would be, that wouldn't be enough. I need a bit of friction there because I want that to tell me it's a bit secure. Or if I'm, you know, uh, if I'm complaining about something, I want to know the other person's taken enough time 
to get back to me. So maybe I'd rather, if my complaint was being dealt with, I'd rather it takes three days rather than immediate. If it takes three days, I believe you've looked into it properly. Whereas if you come back too quickly, I think, well, you're just robbing milk. So I completely agree with, with Alex. Thinks, I completely agree with that point that there's times where you want friction and times where the experience, that's one more example, the experience about food. If you think of McDonald's and a Michelin star restaurant, if you go to McDonald's, they're both about buying food. If you go to McDonald's, you want it really quick. You want it as quick as humanly possible. I want the cheeseburger. I know what I want. Take my 99p. Give me, give me the burger. If I go to a Michelin star restaurant, I want to take my time. It's not about speed anymore. It's not about the food arriving as quickly as possible. I want time to look at the menu. I want them to come and explain the menu to tell me about the dishes. I want a bit of time between my courses. I maybe want them to change the tablecloth. I maybe want them to bring me new cutlery, all of which could be described as friction because it's not completely frictionless necessarily, but because I'm looking for a different experience. So I think it's a, it's a really, really good point. I really agree with that it's not all about yeah, being dead easy. Um, and that also brings up a good question, uh, that do you think customer experience is sector specific? And by that, I mean, like, um, I wrote a piece back in 99 called the internet contrarian in which I was saying wrongly, it turned out, uh, and you'll see why, uh, that the minute, you know, uh, Amazon, uh, had a competitor, like let's say Walmart on my uh, hypothesis was that Walmart was going to become an online store as well, and that they were going to underprice Amazon. And that since it was through a screen, I'm just going to buy it from uh, Walmart. Yes. Well, I was wrong. <laughs> How did that work out? <laughs> <laughs> that did not work out. I use Amazon for everything, pretty much. And, and so is there anything special about Amazon? Now, I know there's a huge brouhaha right now going, at least in the US, Amazon is saying you can't return things for free anymore. And people are like livid. But why do I have, is it just because I'm accustomed to it? Why, why do I have an allegiance to getting all my stuff from Amazon? Yeah, I just think it's good. It's, it's the most useful alternative at the moment. Um, so this, this goes to my, to the heart of my question about my point about the myth of customer loyalty. Because it's not that you're loyal to Amazon in any way at all. It's just really useful for you at the moment. If overnight Amazon's price, well, to your point, actually, if Amazon's price is tripled overnight and suddenly you had to do a two-factor authentication sign on every time you went to the website, you just stop using it because yeah. it's become less, it's become less useful. <clears throat> now that, you know, that, and that is true, you know, it could be about price, it could be about speed, it could be, it could be psychologically, it could be that an organization is socially useful to you. So for example, lots of people bought Teslas early on. Partly because they were good cars, but partly because they wanted to be shown, shown as someone that buys a Tesla. You know, Tesla is my badge. It's the badge that tells you the kind of person I am. Now, what's interesting is as Elon Musk has become slightly less palatable, Tesla is equally now slightly less cool. So that stops to become useful in a, in a social sense as well. So ultimately, yeah, Amazon has just done a very good job of just staying the most useful alternative. And it's got brand salience. It's the first one that you think of. It's got a proven track record because most of the time it's delivered well for you. If it hasn't delivered well, it's probably done the refund super quickly or dealt with the problem really quickly because they know that that's worth it more than keeping me on the phone for an hour and a half arguing about a bow tie. So they just managed to just stay far more, far more useful. I'm, I'm interested to see what happens with Amazon in the next four or five years because actually I think their website's a bit of a mess now. You know, they've got so much that they farmed off to marketplace. It's really hard to buy products now because you go, I think, well, no, let me rephrase that. It's easy to buy products. It's hard to know that you've got confidence in the product you're buying. Because when you search for something on Amazon, it comes up with a load of sponsored links. Then it comes up with a load of marketplace. And then it comes up, and I'm like, I just, what's the thing I'm buying from Amazon? Like, you know, and it's interesting because that's becoming, a, I think, a far worse experience, actually, just shopping with Amazon overall. Um, at the moment, they don't seem to care too much about that, which, you know, probably suggests they're doing fine and they've tried to link in all of the other elements of Prime as well. So that probably, probably keeps people together. But I do wonder if you start to get some decent comp competition. Um, in the UK, we've got bookshop.org, which is starting to do a roaring, show, roaring trade just at the bookstore. This bookshop has Amazon started out. And so now I've switched from Amazon to bookshop just because it's, it's far better. But it is, it's so useful. It's as long as you stay more useful and you keep your eyes up and you know what matters to customers, then you're probably going to be able to kind of keep those customers coming back to you. But 
you can't take it for granted as Kodak and, uh, you know, Toys R Us and Woolworths and a whole load of other companies will, will attest to. And I, I love the way you phrase that too, useful. I, you know, like people say, what, what is your purpose when they're talking, when I'm getting interviewed? And I say, well, I guess my purpose is to be useful. And <laughs> if, if that is your purpose, suddenly you think about things very differently. You do things very differently. Uh, and like your experience or recounting the experience with Amazon is bang on. Like I, I, I was one, I'm an early adopter of text, right? I love technology and everything. So I bought the first CD player and I, you know, adopted all of, all of the stuff. And I was the first to move everything to my iTunes, uh, mm -hmm. when they came out. And then I watched them systematically destroy iTunes to the point where it became unusable, right? What is, is there some sort of imperative? Is it where like, every, I always joked to my family. Yeah. Every tech upgrade is actually a significant downgrade. Um, and it's happening now with Apple TV too. They're fucking it up. And yeah. just like they did with iTunes, it, what's going on there? Yeah. I, I think there's two things there. One is this unrelenting need for change because I think so many people are employed now. They just feel like, it sounds a little thing to say, but they just feel like they have to keep doing stuff to prove their jobs. So they keep tweaking and changing things, even though actually you kind of go, oh, it's good. Just leave it as it is. And that's why so many people don't want to upgrade their Mac software because they go, no, I like, I like the version of iTunes I've got, for example. I don't want to, I don't want to keep doing that. And the other thing I think circles back around to the conversation we had at the start about just being able to keep yourself in the mind of the user. Because the problem is if you're a, a developer that's designing, you know, if you're working on Apple TV, you're so in Apple TV, you're so in it, you've forgotten what it's like to, to not know all the ins and outs of Apple TV. You've forgotten what it's like to be the person at home with a wife or a husband and a couple of kids and a dog running around. And the kind of, do you, do you remember, wasn't it Apple TV when the remote first came out and you didn't know which way around you had to hold it, I think. Right. And I don't know about you, but immediately when I got my Apple TV, I had to buy a cheap plastic case for it because within three seconds, my son had stood, and, stood on it. <laughs> you know, you just, it's only when you observe people that you get to see these kind of, these kind of behaviors. It's only when you really kind of get into the detail of it, going right back to that point. And I think that's the problem that people are particularly maybe in the kind of developer world, for example, are just very, uh, into the data and the design and the code side of things. They just don't take the time to properly step out. I did see a brilliant piece by the CEO of the Atlantic the other day, I piece a video on LinkedIn about, uh, the, um, the of Uber who had just signed up in secret to be an Uber driver for a week just to experience what that was really like. And we know we need more of that. We call it immersion. We need more of that immersion in people's lives. I should tell you one quick story on that, which is I um, worked with a food manufacturing company a few years ago, and uh, it was all about ready meals, convenience food, you know, quick food to put in the microwave. And so uh, I went to interview this lady and she was in her forties, yoga instructor, super healthy, said she cooked everything from scratch, that she would never uh, use ready meals, would never use convenience food, wouldn't use a microwave, you know. Okay. And checked out, she had lots of recipe books, lots of ingredients. And about, uh, it's about an hour later, I went shopping with her. It's the second part of the cast. I went shopping with her and we're going up and down the aisles and we got to the ready meal aisle and I thought, well, we're going to fly down here. But halfway down, she stopped and she threw in a ready made mashed potato. Okay. And then she threw in a ready chopped red onion. So I said, well, what's going on here? I thought you never yeah, you use ready meals. And she went, well, I haven't got time to peel and chop vegetables. I'm not, I'm not mad. And then we got to the, the end aisle where the confectionery and the alcohol is. And I thought, well, we're not getting anything from here because she's told me like body is a temple, et cetera. But no, she swept in loads, like, like a supermarket sweep, just piling in chocolate and Prosecco. Couldn't get enough of the champagne. And I said, well, what's that about? And she went, oh, well, that's girls night on a Friday night. That doesn't count. And that's why you have to observe customers. Because even if you ask people, People lie, not on purpose, but they tell you the version of themselves that they want to believe. And I've got loads of stories I can tell you, but I'm sure we're nearly out of time. But, and that's the problem with the Apple TV thing, as an example, the iTunes thing, that even if you go and observe people in a formal setting, if you came around my house to come and observe me, I'd have the kids sat down nicely on the sofa. 
We'd sit down together, I'd have the remote, we'd watch something nice, we'd all laugh. In reality, it's absolute chaos. There's kids all over there, there's stuff being thrown, but I'm not going to let a visitor see that. And I probably wouldn't want to admit to anyone that's true. So you have to observe people in a way that, you know, you can do that. And that goes back to your original point about I spend a lot of time in strangers' houses, you know, watching them and asking them questions. And it's the only way. It's the only way you can really get under the skin of what's really going on and what you need to design. Otherwise, everything else is just built on uh, assumptions that often prove to not be true. Oh, that's brilliant, John. And uh, the, uh, w- what an endlessly fascinating uh, thing to talk about because it seems to me now that th- that you know, this view is at least getting a better hearing. Uh, people are immediate, like I, I mentioned to a friend that I was going to be talking to you and he immediately started recounting like his horrible experiences at, you know, <laughs> X, Y, and Z. And, and it's, it, it, people will talk, will be honest about it. Right. But you, you need to create an environment in which that can happen and which you certainly have done. Well, this has been amazing i think uh everyone should read your book and and check out what you're doing at the at the end of uh each of our podcasts we um ask our guests a question in that we're going to make you the emperor of the world for one day um you you can't uh kill anyone and you can't re-educate anyone in a camp uh, but what you can do is we're going to hand you a magic microphone and you're going to speak two thoughts into it and that those two thoughts will be incepted on the entire population of the world. Whenever those 8 billion people wake up in their next day, they're going to sit up in bed and they're going to think, I've just had two brilliant ideas and I'm going to do both of them. What, what, what two things are you going to incept in the world's population? Oh, it's a massive, it's a massive question. <laughs> That's a massive question. I think I, um, there's maybe two things I would say. But I might have a cheeky, a cheeky third as well. I think I would, um, I would say advice is what you ask for when you already know the answer, but you're too afraid to admit it. Uh, because I often find that lots of people are asking advice when they're just trying to avoid the decision. And so advice is good. But whenever you're asking for advice, really think about actually, do I already really know? Do I already really know the, the, the answer? Um, and the second one, I think, is one I talk about at the start of the book, which is this principle that you are everyone you've ever met. Like you're, you're made up of every single interaction and conversation with everyone you've ever met. And the reason that matters is because my concern is we're, we're stopping paying attention to people. You know, heads down on our phone, earphones in, you know, all of the stuff that I observe that makes me laugh, that makes me think, that makes me smile. Most of it is stuff that you don't expect to observe. It's the odd conversation on the train, on the train you weren't expecting the post that you see. And so I think the, you know, that, that may not be the right number. The, the you or everyone you've ever met, I think is a principle to, to remember that means you need to be observing the world. You need to be open to the world and you need to be kind of making the most of all of those different occasions. But my cheeky third one is just a bit of advice my nan gave me. She passed away at the age of 102, uh, which was you've got a laugh at the world. And you've got to drink whiskey every day. They were her two <laughs> rules for having a having a long and happy life to 102. Laugh at the world, <laughs> drink whiskey every day. And uh, so if she was there and she had the magic pen, they would be her two bits of advice. And I probably can't better those, actually. <laughs> I love both of those and I love her. Well, this has been phenomenal. Uh, how, do we, how do people find the book? How do they find you? Yeah, thanks, Jim. Yeah, so the book's called The Human Experience. It's out in the UK, the USA, Australia soon. It's in all good bookshops, including um, including Amazon. Um, I'm uh, uh, You can find me on all the social networks. My website's John J. Seals, S I W O S dot com. I'm on LinkedIn, John J. Seals, Twitter, John J. Seals. And I've got an Instagram account, which is CX underscore stories, which is where I just post lots of photos of slightly frustrating, but quite funny, I think. Uh, customer experiences. So, uh, yeah, if you say, if you say it's John J. Seals, you'll end up finding me somewhere. I love it. Thank you so much for giving me so much of your time, John. A wonderful book and wonderful conversation. No, thank you, Jim. I really, really appreciate the, the conversation. I really enjoyed it.